All right, we are live. We're live. Hello and welcome everyone to another Sales Hacker webinar. As always, when we have Miss Beck Holland on, we get a ridiculous amount of people signing up. So I can see everyone uh, coming in the door now. Um, Beck and I actually did a similar webinar to this on Flip the Script uh, a while back, and I convinced her, berated her, hey, you have to do this for the Sales Hacker community. Um, so here we are. And before I introduce Beck Holland, who really needs no introduction, uh, super quick housekeeping. So if you've ever been on these, you know these are recorded. So if you have to jump off, uh, have a one-on-one -on -one with your manager, you got to close a deal, whatever it is, uh, go deal with that. We will go send it. it. Go close it. Go, go close, close it. it. <laughs> yes, exactly. We don't want to hold you from that. That is the most important thing. So uh, we'll have this in your inbox within about 24 hours. Second thing is, uh, Beck and I get to talk all the time. I consider myself very lucky to be a friend of hers. We talk shop all the time. So we're doing this uh, for the community. This is for you. So um, we have uh, some kind of really meaty slides to, to get through, uh, but it's always a lot more fun, A, when we know who we're rocking with. So go to the chat, introduce your name, title, where you're from, company, um, and just say hello. Uh, and then number two, um, I'll be manning the, the Q&A. So my job is really to get out of the way, let Beck do her thing, and then be a voice to the community. So if you have specific questions, if you want to challenge anything Beck is saying, uh, if it's not making complete sense to you, if it's not perfect in, in your world, ask the question. And uh, I'll, I'll jump in I have no problem cutting back off um, and, and getting those questions in there. Uh, but we'll try and keep this to an hour. Beck is notorious for going a little bit over. We'll do our best to keep it to an hour. Uh, but that's it. That's the boring stuff out of the way. Beck, welcome. How you doing? I'm doing great. You, you are good at cutting me off, like getting in there. I'd say you're like one in a million of, of one, the only one out of a million. <laughs> you could do that. Usually I'm going such full speed that no one can get a word in edgewise. Yeah. Yeah. Well, I'm excited to go, go through this again. I know last time I was like feverishly taking notes and I'm sure I'm going to learn just as much as I did the, the first time. Cause it's a, it's a lot of stuff. And I want to preface this with like, get ready people like this is, uh, you're going to be hitting uh, value left, right, and center. Uh, we will be going fast. There will be a lot thrown at you. Uh, we did put comprehensive in there for a reason. Uh, so buckle up, uh, get ready. And before I, I hand the reins over to you, Beck, I want to do a super quick poll. Uh, it kind of helps, you know, both of us frame up who, who's in the room. Should we be talking more management? Should we be talking more IC? So I just want to do a quick poll of uh, what is your role? And we'll launch that now. Oh, thank you. Steven said he likes my background lights, my smart use. I'm like, I just want to highlight, you know, the good parts of the room. This is the whole place, by the way. I'm in San Francisco. So I live in basically what looks like the, the uh, size of a Marriott. <laughs> You're not part of the mass exodus to, to Austin yet? We won't be I seeing you. Not. Anytime soon. But, however, my dad sends me, my uh, family's based in Texas and I'm from Texas. And my dad sends me probably an article every morning of new companies that are moving from California to Texas. And he says, he always leads them with, if it's good enough for Elon Musk, it's good enough for flip the script. That's the subject line. <laughs> <laughs> I love it. I love it. Well, yeah, it might be, it might be time. I don't know. Everything I'm reading, at least the Twitter universe says Austin or maybe Miami is the place to be these days. Well, I don't know. Who knows? We'll see. All right. Well, end the poll here. We have, all right, primar primarily AEs joining us, 29% account executives. Uh, we do have good leadership representation, 16% manager, 12% director, 9% VP, 9% C-level, 5% sales enablement. Uh, and then 16% SDR. Uh, so hopefully that helps. Uh, it's kind of all over the map. So it's not super helpful, to be honest. We have representation from, uh, from all groups today. You always draw a big, big crowd. So let's, uh, let's dive into it. 
Yeah, let's dive in. So, um, hi everyone. Thank you for attending this. So I essentially want to just dive in here. Um, the really the impetus behind this was I started um, about four years ago personalizing at uh, scale essentially introducing personalization into my messaging. And um, that started the journey for me of understanding, okay, if I was doing a personalized book, how could I really build a play? You know, essentially, because it's going to be, you know, structure for every single person, but it's, it was almost like a Mad Libs uh, format. So I started thinking, I'm like, well, okay, I could build a shell you know, sequence essentially within uh, outreach, you know, to say like, okay, this is where I'd personalize, et cetera, et cetera. And then I started thinking, okay, well, what I would have to basically limit down to play in this case. So I started fanning out into a couple of different plays on attribution source. And so that started a journey of starting to stack up plays and measure them against one another from a sequencing perspective within outreach. So full disclosure, this is going to be a very meaty session and a very uh, technical session. I'm going to use a lot of acronyms and we will send the, the deck out afterwards. Um, but why don't we just jump in here? So as far as the roadmap, and I just want you to get guys to have this for a graphical perspective, let me um, pull up this cheat sheet right off the bat. Um, can you all see my screen? Okay, someone said yes. So these are essentially gonna be the four categories that we're gonna go into today. So traditionally there's only been two categories you know, of lead source. There has been inbound and there has been outbound. And inbound is usually defining, uh, defined as everything from, um, you know, uh, demo requests to content download to webinar registrant to event attendee, you know, et cetera. And what I'd found on my teams is these are all very different, all very different in terms of buyer intent, all very different in terms of, you know, their uh, user journey. Uh, and so I essentially wanted to break these out today and give you a couple of plays to think about, you know, I'm going to shoot this encyclopedia just for a graphical perspective at the beginning, and then we're going to, we can dive into each one of the plays that you have available. And I'm going to uh, include at the onset how you can run a personalization uh, messaging strategy within these plays at large. Um, but from a high level, there's four categories within the, this encyclopedia. So you'll get this PDF afterwards, but let's dive in here. Far left is going to be inbound. Inbound being defined as a hand raiser, someone who wants to evaluate your product. And then far right being defined as cold outbound. So cold outbound, meaning there's no reason to reach out to them other than um, you know, personalization, essentially something that we've done they've done. Um, and so I want you to pay attention to this top graphical bar. It will be progressively more outbound the further right that you go. This second line is just a definition. Um, so basically inbound is going to be, like I said, hand raisers. And this is, you know, prospect knows your company. Outbound is going to be someone who doesn't know you at all. Maybe you've defined them with an ABM strategy. You're like, I want to dive into this account. Middle left is going to be what I call postbound. So postbound is going to be non-hand raising marketing leads. So for instance, we're going to go into a couple of them here, but I have like content downloads or webinar registrants. So, you know, you attended this webinar, you know, because you wanted to learn about a specific topic, not because you necessarily wanted to purchase me as a consultant. Right. I mean, that would be the dream. <laughs> that would be the dream. But you came here to learn about a topic. So we're going to go into how to leverage um, these kind of leads to get in front of more of them. How to, from an automation perspective, trim out the ones that you don't want to talk to and the ones that you do and, you know, specialize in the ones that you do. And then also what kind of messaging strategy to do on the back end. But essentially, I just want you to get this from a graphical representation perspective, you know, what this lead looks like. But Postbound is going to be middle left, and this is non hand raising marketing leads. And uh, middle right is going to be what I call bridge bound. So, uh, it, on the inbound case, I use one to many messaging only, meaning if someone requests a demo, you don't need to personalize to them. You know, they're, they're coming into you, they just want, want to talk about the product. Outbound, you're going to use one to one messaging only for personalization. For postbound and bridgebound, I combine one to many messaging of like, hi, I noticed that you attended the sales hacker, you know, webinar on uh, the comprehensive encyclopedia of sales plays. But more importantly, 
and then you transition to uh, your personalization. And the same within Bridgebound. You know, I noticed that you did this thing, and but more importantly, I saw that you wrote this article, et cetera. So there's going to be four categories underneath Bridgebound. This is going to be the meatiest category that we're going to go into. There's going to be, um, you know, two plays or two buckets of plays that are going to raise the likelihood that your prospects will take a meeting, but not necessarily that they are going to buy. And then there's going to be two buckets of plays that raise the likelihood that they will ultimately buy because there's a higher need for your product. And you can define this before you even try to get a meeting with them. So I just wanted everyone to have this in their mind, you know, of what this looks like. So, you know, uh, from a uh, aesthetic reference, you'll know what I'm talking about. But let's go ahead and jump back into the deck. Um, and I want, want to unpack each one of these plays. Um, can you all see my screen again? Can you see it now? Okay. Looks good. So, okay. For every sequence that I'm doing, and I'm building a sequence for each one of those plays that will go into all of them, I essentially do, essentially do the same type of infrastructure for the sequence itself. Now there's some variation dependent on the play, but most of them I'm running a 16 step process over 21 business days with a LinkedIn research step on the front end, which I'm spending five minutes where I get to know the prospect, go to their LinkedIn profile, tease out three personalized premises that I can relate back to my value prop, save them within outreach, for instance, and that will fuel the rest of the sequence. Within the sequence itself, out of the 16 steps, there's one LinkedIn research step, five emails and 10 cold calls, two voicemails in those cold calls, and I'm more aggressive on the back end than I am on the front end. So essentially, I take after the theory of uh, MJ Hoffman. He's the author of Why You, Why You Now. And he basically found that if you, uh, he did some research on the cadence to reach out. And he found that if you are more aggressive in the front end of your sequence, and then you peter off near the end, you're essentially too overwhelming in the beginning. And then you teach your prospect that if they just wait long enough, you'll go away. So you want to flip that essentially. So this is the structure that I use essentially. And I, again, we'll send this out in the deck, but I essentially am uh, easier on my prospect in terms of the cadence of outreach earlier on in the sequence, and I'm more aggressive near the back end. So, you know, you can see there's five pods really to the outreach day one, one, two, cold email, cold call, cold call, day eight, eight, nine, cold email, cold call, cold call, day 13, 13, 14. You know, so there's a six day business sell to here, there's a four day business sell to here, and then uh, the third pod is day 13, 13, 14 you know, day 18, 18, 19, and 20, 21, 21. And so right here near the back end, you'll see a lot of conversion. So the highest conversion steps for me are usually cold email one, cold email uh, two, and then uh, this last break of email. So usually three and four are actually the lowest conversion rates in terms of the sequence. Um, you know, but they're building up to this breakup email where I see a very uh, high amount of conversion on this. And this is basically a template in terms of the personalization that I'm including. And I want to be very brief on this. So I stay on time. But what I mean by personalization, <laughs> no matter what the debate is on LinkedIn, personalization, as Google defines it, is one to one only, meaning I am talking to Scott about something that Scott did. And if I can replicate that across many different people, then it then becomes relevance. So relevance is one to many that I can repeat it. One to one is personalization. So what I mean by personalization is not business acumen, you know, not industry relevance, not buyer persona relevance. All of that is relevance only. Personalization is one to one in terms of I'm speaking to Scott about Scott something Scott did. This is where I've seen the lion's share of my conversion. So. You know, TLDR, I've taken, uh, I took th uh, three teams, you know, from anywhere uh, uh, 4X at minimum to an 8X conversion based on including some piece of personalized data. There are five diff different buckets to this, and I'm going to cover this within 30 seconds. If you want to know more, if you go to flipthescript.co, there's a session on personalization at scale. But essentially within personalization, you have a self-authored bucket. So this would be any kind of content that Scott uh, authored himself webinar he was a part of, article, post, and you want to be thinking about how do I relate this back to my product. Number two is engaged content, anything that Scott liked, shared, or commented on. 
three is going to be uh, self-identified traits. This is profile line, headline, company line, uh, essentially what Scott wrote about himself on his LinkedIn. And these are ranked in terms of order that you should see conversion, meaning buckets one and two are the, the best, uh, you know, down to bucket uh, four and five. The fourth bucket is going to be junk drawers, schools attended, personal interests, hobbies, recommendations, skill endorsement, anything non really business related that you then need to tie back to your value prop. And then number five is going to be company level data. So uh, this bucket is really, is it a, you know, solid as a liquid? It's really a gel, right? So technically, if you do something that's specific to outreach, for instance, for Scott, you could replicate that across to many users, but it's about Scott's comp company in specific. So that's why I include it here. But this is the lowest bucket of conversion. Usually, regardless of ICP, you know, 80 to 85% of the time, I can find something within buckets one through four, and I can find three premises in under five minutes. So, you know, most of this, uh, if you want to know more about personalization, I have a whole section of my website called Personalization Point, where I go much deeper on this topic. Uh, but for, uh, to stay on topic, this is just as a, a precursor. So this is what I mean by personalization. If you're going to run a book with uh, personalization and relevance, Essentially, once you get this deck, you'll see much deeper for the four different buckets of plays. I have inbound, postbound, bridge bound, and cold outbound. These dark uh, blue buckets signify something that you can automate. And the light blue buckets are something you cannot automate that you need an SDR or an actual rep to include. So for instance, for inbound here, like I mentioned, you know, you don't need to personalize. They're coming to you. You know, so it's like, you know, hi, let's set up a time essentially. And so you can automate that post bound and bridge bound, which we'll go into all the examples of these plays in, in just a moment um, is basically I would automate for every single one of these cadences based on attribution. So let's take content downloads, for instance, you know, hi, a reason for my outreach is I noticed that you recently downloaded blank and you can put a dynamic tag where it uh, couches what the content was. And it says, but more importantly, and that's where the rep would go in and essentially insert the personalization. So again, light blue is gonna be uh, 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 personalization that essentially the rep has to do. Dark blue, you can automate. And bridge bound the same thing, the dark blue you can automate, you know, and then the light blue, uh, essentially the rep has to do. So for cold outbound, for instance, if I have no one to many play, then essentially I would have to go all personalization, which is hi Scott, reason my outreach that I noticed you downloaded or you uh, wrote this article on X, Y, and Z. One line in specific that stood out to me was X and it's gonna be light blue. So that's from a high view, how you're gonna, how you can structure the sequences for each one of these plays. So let's dive into what each one of these plays are now with no further, I'm not gonna uh, bait anyone any longer. So far left, is going to again be inbound and how I'm defining inbound. If you went to your SDR team and told them, you know, how do the inbound leads look? They would say, uh, well, what do you mean by inbound? They'll tell you that any, you know, uh, content downloads are much different in terms of conversion than a demo request. And what they'll tell you is they'll say the the content download leads aren't as good. And what they mean by not as good is not necessarily the company titles, or the title of the person who's downloading the content, what they mean is the buyer intent isn't there. So with the demo request, someone's asking to see my product, whereas a content download, you know, they're, they're not essentially. They want to know the topic of the content. So I am defining inbound for nomenclature's sake as true hand raisers. There's only two types of pl uh, plays here. You have demo requests and you have people who come in via the chat box. So pretty straightforward. Middle left, which is postbound, uh, which you would incorporate, you know, one-to-many messaging along with personalization for one-to-one, -one, is essentially postbound. As a reminder, is non-hand raising marketing leads. And where I got the term is in basketball. I watch a lot of NBA, and in basketball, someone who is between the top of the key and the basket is called a post. They're right in the middle. So uh, that's where I incorporated the, the post term, but this is a non hand raising marketing lead. And there are 12 different types of uh, leads that I know of uh, within Postbound. Number one is content downloads. Two is webinar registrants. Three, 
buyer intent. So for instance, if you're using a provider, some of these plays are predicated on you using a piece of tech. So number three is a great example. Uh, if you know of G2 at Trust Radius, they are third party review sites. So let's say that I wanted to go check out, you know, what other people are saying about outreach in specific. You know, I would go to G2, I look up the reviews. And when I did that, G2 and Trust Radius can gate back to um, outreach saying like, hey, someone from Flip the Script is researching you. You know, so those are what we call buyer intent leads. You know, these are for purchase. So this is not, you know, a, a free type of lead. Uh, but these are our review sites. And the great things about these, a, a lot of times you're going to get middle of the funnel uh, for buyer intent, meaning people who you've already demoed, who are simply, you know, double checking to see what other people think about uh, reviews. But sometimes at the onset, you know, people are doing more research than ever before, before they engage with you. Uh, Forrester did a uh, research, did a, a report on um, all the things people consider before they buy something. There are 20 variables and the top three were number one, they go peer to peer, meaning I call Scott and I'm like, hey, who are you using for data? You know, number two, I go to industry influencers. And number three, um, I uh, want to read reviews, essentially what their users have said. So uh, a lot of people are in their sweatpants, so to speak, you know, in their bed, trying to do as much research as they can. You go down another 16 variables. And the last thing that people consider is a demo. They don't want to jump on a demo because they know they're going to be sold and they're going to be pushed, you know, et cetera. It would be my guess. You know, so this is a great way to surface people who are checking you out from the lead generation perspective, and you can put them into a play, um, you know, and, and pattern or based on some language and try to get them to actually jump on a demo call with you. Uh, number four is going to be free trials or a freemium model. Uh, I'm working with a number of clients that this is actually a really, uh, really hefty play that we're using and seeing a lot of early success with uh, is freemium. Uh, I, my one, you know, I can't go into messaging today. I don't have the time, but my one ask here would be, you know, if I, for instance, I downloaded Slack, the free version, if Slack wanted to sell me on a paid version, essentially they would have to solve for a pain point that I can't currently solve for with, uh, the free version, you know? So, uh, I would keep that in mind if you're selling freemium that you need to be thinking about what your user experience is and what would I have to pitch about this product that would encourage someone, uh, that would alleviate a problem or a pain point for them that you can't currently alleviate with the, the free version. So, you know, Pandora, it's like, I don't have the pain point that I want to, you know, skip the ads. It's like, I can sit through a couple of ads. So I'd be think, get my gears thinking about uh, that when I'm reaching into freemium. Five is event attendees. Uh, that's, you know, virtual event attendees for now, kind of like webinar, the same thing. But when we go back, hopefully there'll be more events. Six is uh, followers on your social, your company's social. So LinkedIn, Facebook, or Instagram, you know, you have a lot of followers. Seven is people who interact with your company on social, but aren't followers. So people who are sharing the, con the content, commenting on it, liking it, et cetera. These are different buckets. You know, there are a number of YouTube channels that I watch that I don't share, or you know, that I follow, some that I follow, some that I share and comment and like, on, you know, and like, uh, and some that I do neither. So, you know, number six is going to be people who are following you on social and number seven is going to be people who are interacting, but there are groups of both. So social media is a wild beast. You know, it's proven a couple things to us. Number one, that everyone wants to be famous. Number two, that everyone craves validation because the first thing we want is likes, shares, comments, et cetera. You know, but number three, I'd be thinking through how you use social media. So I want you to compare for a second in your mind, the amount of times that you have posted on social media in the last month. And then I want you to cross compare that to the amount of times that you've logged on to social media and you have looked at other people's posts, but not posted yourself. I mean, it's like what, a thousand to one, <laughs> right? So even though people aren't posting necessarily, they can be looking uh, very different buckets here. Number eight, it, blog subscriber, a nine newsletter. Scott, you look like you had a question. I do. Yeah, I was going to let you finish this thought. Uh, Ramco has a good question. Where would you put an open source community version offering when you also sell a paid version? Is it like the free trials post bound category? Same thing? 
Yes. I mean, this is, again, this is marketing efforts, non-hand raising marketing efforts. So the community, I would imagine, is run, you know, by the marketing team. So, and is piped over by the marketing team by definition. So I would likely put a community in here. Well, you just added a play. There you go. <laughs> What's that? I actually, I was falling asleep last night or no, I had a dream last night when I woke up and I'm like, oh, there's another play. There's people who are out of office. I was like, dang it. <laughs> so this play book is bumping up and up and up. Um, but this is a the community would be a, a great example if you're running a community. So uh, what was the person's name? Remco. Congratulations, Remco. You now work for Flip the Script. <laughs> <laughs> Unfortunately, I'm really sorry. <laughs> you just added the content. So uh, eight blog subscriber, nine newsletter. Uh, 10 dark funnel. Uh, so this is going to be dark funnel providers are uh, six cents and Bambora, two great examples. Um, but basically this is people who are researching your product on like Google, for instance, uh, and not doing anything else about it. So they can use cookies to track that and essentially rank people uh, higher up the funnel. So dark funnels, people who have not done any marketing action but are still in the funnel so remember people are staying choked up top way to like top 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 of funnel before they engage with anything uh, 11 is high value mql so the only reason someone would become an mql but it you know not for one of these other pre-existing reasons would be if someone's opening a lot of your marketing emails then likely they will flux into dependent on your definition of mql and number 12 is going to be website views. So I'm going to go through an entire list of what I know uh, now with community, sub community, bereft of community, uh, but the entire list of what I know, but I'm not necessarily going to take an opinion on whether some of these plays, you know, I like them or not, whether I've seen success, et cetera. So just keep that in mind. This is going to be a comprehensive list. So that's everything for Postbound. You know, that's Blink all. Twice if you like them, Beck. Just uh, I'm sorry? Blink twice if you really like the play. <laughs> if I really like the play, I think that the shorter list for me is, um, the ones is you don't like. right. Ones that I don't like. There's a few that I don't like, but I would say for each org, this is going to be very different. So it depends on what product you sell, you know, SMB, mid-market enterprise, general business to SMB, mid-market general business enterprise, what kind of vertical are you, et cetera. So you know, you're going to be running some conglomeration of these plays, um, you know, but it's certainly not all of them. Uh, but uh, so I would be more married to my, what I like is uh, revenue, <laughs> right? So I have no opinion post uh, data, right? So it's like, I am, if I would give myself a pat on the back for anything in my career, it's that I am extremely open-handed with, I have an opinion, a strong opinion beforehand and I voice it, you know, but I'm extremely open to what the data will tell me. So there's been some place where I'm like, not in a billion years, is that going to work? And it worked. And I'm like, well, let's double down, you know, let's, let's make it happen. But um, so let's go into bridge bound bridge bound again, as a reminder is middle, right. And this is a way to do segmented outbound based on a one to many premise, uh, that it's a non-marketing lead. This is the most exhaustive category. And all of these plays can be run by a conglomeration of roles. It's going to depend on your org. Do you have an SDR team? You know, do you have an AE team that self prospects? Do you have an RM, AM, upsell, cross sell renewal team? And so these are all the plays cross org. And I certainly have fiery opinions on who should be owning what, you know, uh, usually within context. But this is just going to be an entire list of all the plays you can run for a pipeline generation perspective. So if you'll uh, remember, there were two buckets uh, and then two buckets within under each bucket. So the bucket on the left hand uh, left hand side, immediate middle uh, middle right, was um, the two buckets that will raise the likelihood that your prospect will take a meeting, but not that they will ultimately buy. So the first bucket underneath that is going to be bridge bound based on relationship. This is the most extensive bucket. So number one is uh, companies who share a common VC with your company. Number two is going to be companies that share a common VC with your customers. 
So uh, this is an example of one that I thought not in a million years would work. You know, and I'm like, I'll put together the language and, you know, put together the language worked insatiably well. I was like, okay, <laughs> well, it does. So I wouldn't discount this play, but common VC with your customers. So you have, you know, let's say outreach has three customers, for instance, you know, they have whatever Twilio, Cloudflare and PagerDuty. And uh, you want to, you know, go into, let's say in structure and they share a common VC of Bessemer Venture Partners. So they share the common VC with a customer of yours that you have. Number three is referral to the network of your happy customers. So, I mean, the stat is, is that 87% of people are willing to make a referral. Customers are willing to make a referral, not even happy customers, just customers in general, but only 7% of reps ask for them. So this can be a really great play. Um, you know, my biggest advice here is do the work for them of who you want them to make the intro to, you know, go through their LinkedIn and scour through. At uh, number four, inbound referrals from your VC partners. So let's say, you know, someone, um, Ross Beesman, who's CRO and works with Bessemer quite a bit, you know, let's say that he sent in an inbound referral uh, and he said, hey, you need to talk to this person. So some of these, this is an instance of you can't control the quantity of this, right? Can't control how often that Ross makes an introduction, but I would always say, put it in a actual sequence. So number one, you can make sure you follow up with that lead. Number two, you can measure the effectiveness of that play, you know, so you can increase it. So I will always side with Billy Bean um, of like, you can't, you can't in, improve anything really that you can't measure. So you need to start with measuring it by sequencing and into a play. So you're very intentional about what you're doing. At number five is outbound to the network of the VC partners. So let's say I, instead of taking leads from Ross, I'm act, actively going to his LinkedIn and looking through his connections and saying like, is there anyone, you know, I'm trying to prospect into pager duty. Is there anyone that Ross knows, you know, uh, that I can essentially prospect into? Six is inbound referrals from your C-suite. So this would be, you know, Manny sending a lead over to, um, over to Scott and saying like, hey, you need to talk to this person, that's ideal. Seven would be uh, Scott is going to Manny's network on LinkedIn. And, you know, it's kind of awkward if they're friends of Manny trying to push for the meeting and that's not, you know, quote unquote, his, his place necessarily, right? He's, you know, much higher and making much more strategic decisions. So this is Scott getting gritty, you know, and reaching out to someone within Manny's network. Uh, eight, inbound referrals from your advisors. Nine, outbound to the network of your advisors. You know, really in, in the inbound situations, they're great, but you're not in control of volume. Uh, in the outbound situation, you will impress your advisors <laughs> by, and I would always say, do the homework for them, find the referrals for them, and then ping them based on context beforehand. Both of those steps are very important. <laughs> you know, to do the homework for them, to show, to not make the lift be on them. And then also ask them for advice, you know, maybe they're willing to make the referral in for you. So I'd always reach out to them, um, you know, to ask beforehand. 10 is inbound referrals from the board, board of directors. 11 is outbound to the network of the board of directors. You're starting to see a, a pattern here. 12 is inbound referrals from your customer advisors. Uh, you know, so for instance, when I was at Chorus, Jake Rennie was on our customer advise, uh, advisory board and you know, we loved the product. So, you know, 12 would be Jake sending, um, sending me over some uh, referrals. 13 would be me going to Jake's uh, connections on LinkedIn, seeing if he's connected to anyone uh, at PagerDuty because I want to prospect into him. 14 is inbound referral from an influencer. Uh, 15 is going to be outbound to the network of an influencer that maybe your company is tied to very tightly. 16 is an inbound referral from a non-sales employee. So essentially, again, this, your bottleneck to it's inbound, you know, but essentially let's say that Scott works in CS or uh, let's take Danny Kish over at Outreach. Shout out Danny, absolutely love him. And let's say uh, he knows someone uh, who, you know, potentially wants to buy Outreach you know, then Danny makes an intro, you know, to an account executive or to an SDR to set up that time. So uh, the reason I put non-sales employee here is because if you are a sales employee and you have a referral, then freaking close it. <laughs> Do it yourself. Mostly closers will go after their own network.
Uh, speaking of their own network, uh, number 17 is going to be non-sales hires that used to work at a company. So let's say, let's stick with uh, Twilio, for instance. You know, let's say Danny Kish, you know, came inbound uh, from Twilio, you know, and all of a sudden he wants to make, you know, a difference at the Oregon Outreach. And so he makes an intro to the people over at Twilio because hopefully, you know, he has a good relationship. So this is a someone who used to work at the company who now works at your own company. Um, and 18 is going to be your own network. So usually this is the first thing that account executives exhaust. Uh, but, you know, I just want to outline them here so that you have them. 18A would be friends, uh, friends that you have that are past employees of Twilio. Uh, 18B would be friends uh, that, current, that you have that currently work at Twilio and for lack of better PC terms are groundswell, meaning they're an individual contributor. So the play would be to multi-thread up. Uh, 18C is going to be friends that work at Twilio, who I'm trying to prospect into, who are the decision maker. That's nice and ideal. 18D is going to be friends who are connected to the decision maker at uh, Twilio. So let's say that I have a friend and I'm trying to uh, prospect into Mark Borditsky. He's the CRO over at Twilio. Uh, shout out, Mark, if you were ever watching this. I am such a fangirl of your career. He probably knows that by now um, based on all the messages I've sent. But 18D would be, I, yeah, I have a friend that knows Mark. That restraining order didn't mean a thing. Just kidding. I just, just kidding for everyone on the line. Um, 18D, so it's going to be friends who know Mark, and I really want to, you know, talk to him, so can they make some kind of introduction? And then the last one is going to be prospects who interacted with you on LinkedIn, like you added the prospect, I added Mark on social, he didn't respond to my billions of messages, but for some reason he starts liking my posts, you know, liking, commenting, sharing, etc., um, so that would be the, the 18th play. This happens more than you would think. It happens to me all the time. You know, if like I add someone and then I try to get a meeting with them or whatever. Um, and then they would, they wouldn't respond, but they would, I'd see them like comment and breadcrumb me, you know, <laughs> like comment on something. I'm like, what the heck, you know, um, but this happens quite a bit. So this is another play. And then the last three here, uh, prospects that you met at a networking event. So let's say you went to some community. I went to a modern, you know, whatever, sales hacker had an event, you know, and I went and attended that in person and people that I met there. Uh, again, the, the power behind this thing is sequencing it so you don't forget to follow up on it and that you can measure the effectiveness of the play and then you can rank the plays accordingly so you know what to prioritize. It's not, it's not a, a opinion game anymore. 20, uh, people who interacted with your non and sales employees on social. So let's say that Mark was commenting or liking or sharing Danny Kish, who's over in CS, you know, one of his posts. And I'm like, oh, he must know Danny. And so I'm gonna work that angle. And then number 21 is going to be uh, competitors of your current clients. This, there is a reason that this play is last. I can't stand, <laughs> it's on record. I can't stand this play. I do not know why people do it. Every VP of sales on the earth seems to love this play though of like, oh, you know, we just booked whoever, like, you know, we, I'm not going to name competitor. Like we just, we just booked uh, drift. So now I want to march over to intercom and I basically want to tell them all about it so they can, you know, buy us too. I don't get it, but here's a play. A lot of people like it. So, you know, to each their own, if it works again, I'm a data girl, but this is number 21. And so again, these are all bridge bound based on a relationship. These are plays that will increase the likelihood that you'll get a meeting, not necessarily if the person will buy. So if Manny, you know, Medina comes to me, CEO of outreach and says, Beck, you should meet with this person. I don't care who the person is. I'm going to jump on the line, <laughs> right? I don't, won't necessarily have the pain point that they're looking to solve for, but out of deep respect for Manny, I would jump on the line. So this is, uh, these are going to increase the likelihood that you'll get a meeting, but not that they'll buy. Quickly want to jump in there. This is incredible. Um, two, two good questions. Uh, number one comes from Alex Greer. Alex, good question. Just want to clarify, why are website views so low on the list? Isn't that more direct engagement? Are these in no particular order? Th these are in no particular order. 
these were in the order that they came to my brain, essentially. Um, yeah, so it is not, these are not listed in terms of where you'll see response rates, anything based on data. This is a comprehensive list. So it, it's not down the, the list, essentially. You know, my, my biggest encouragement there from a messaging perspective would be to call out that you think that it's, it could be creepy, you know, not to be a creep, but it seems like you were on the website earlier um, because the it's, sometimes it can trigger even though it's not correct. So I would always be very light and assumptive in my language. You know, same thing for buyer intent, for instance, with G2, not to be come off as a creep, but it seems like someone from your team was researching blah, blah, blah. More importantly, I saw you wrote this article where you're talking about scaling and you go into personalization, but great question. Yeah, great. And you'll have to wait for 2022 or 2023 for the, the breakdown of, of what actually works and all, all the data, we can probably prioritize it eventually, which will be really cool. Totally, yeah. And we could even prioritize not to like bust up all, all the roadmap, but essentially you could prioritize. Again, this is gonna be very different for every company. And I think that's a very important, uh, important point to stress. So you could even hypothetically link segment based on am I SMB mid-market or enterprise selling to SMB mid-market or enterprise based on a certain vertical, you know, what does the data suggest the top three or four plays are for me in specific? And you could, you know, essentially not only rule the world, but you could break up you know, of like, you know, people, a lot of times they'll come to something like this and they'll be like, well, that's great. But what about my company? This isn't necessarily relevant for my company. So it depends on how you segment the data, but you could do some interesting stuff on, on the back end here. Yeah, absolutely. And that actually leads uh, nicely to another, another question, question from Becky. Uh, Becky says, this is great. How much of this can be applied to an enterprise role versus a more transactional role? I've done both, but currently an enterprise and I feel like the plays are different. Would you apply this type of sequencing to the enterprise? Uh, meaning sh I, I want to ask her the question, but I don't know if she can give me a response, meaning she's at enterprise or she's selling into enterprise. Becky, are you an enterprise? Uh, yeah. Are you at an enterprise company or are you selling into enterprise? That would be a great clarification. Selling into enterprise. Sorry. Selling into enterprise. So yeah, from selling into enterprise, you know, I, one of my, the biggest myths about personalization to me is that you should only do it for enterprise. You know, to me, the only thing that enterprise, it, it's not like I work at an SMB company and I can't stand personalization. I don't want you to know who I am, but then I go to IBM and I'm like, oh, now I know, I want you to know who I am. Like the human <laughs> response, you know, it's gonna be relatively, I could argue, you know, that it might be based on buyer persona of like marketing might like it more than, you know, backend engineers, et cetera. But essentially, to me, the segment of company has nothing really to do with it. I'd argue that SMB companies might value it more because someone who works at LinkedIn, you know, they get a lot of attention. But someone who works at an up and coming SMB company, they don't get people who are personalizing to them all the time. So to me, it's like it spikes rates in SMB, mid market and enterprise. That's what I've seen it do across the board. The only thing that selling into enterprise from a pipeline gen perspective would change is your amount of contacts that are available to prospect into, but like the meeting count is just gonna jump, right? But now with an enterprise, I can sell into 50 people. Whereas, you know, like I'll take my last company chorus, we sold into Rev, uh, sales ops, sales, sales enablement, and SDR, you know, at a SMB company and director or uh, uh, manager level and above. It's like, okay, at an SMB company, you might only have five people at a, that you can reach out to within that IC, uh, ICT. You know, within mid-market, you might have upwards of 20, 25. And within enterprise, you could have anywhere from, you know, who knows, 50, 100, 200 people that you could read out, reach out to. So the playbook stays the same. I think the need for automation and for structure arguably jumps up, you know, in terms of uh, how much you do need this type of uh, process. But the messaging infrastructure from personalization view, it's like, you know, they, they like it either way. And I've seen it drive results for people selling in uh, regardless of segment. 
And it takes the same amount of time, not to harp on this too much, I digress, but it takes the same amount of time to send a personalized email to someone who works at IBM as it does someone who works at an SMB company. Same exact amount of time. So I would say, you know, I, I wouldn't stick it to just enterprise. I would set a bar of who you're trying to sell into and then deploy the personalization book on the top of it. Awesome. Katie's like, I'm sorry I asked. <laughs> <laughs> no, she's very fun. It's an amazing perspective. Uh, quick clarifying question. Groves wants to know, please define what enterprise represents to you. What do you define enterprise as? Yeah, I mean, it's it's less of what enterprise means to me. I mean, it meaning it varies for every company. So I, I again, I've been working across the board and how people are typically defining enterprise is going to be anywhere from a thousand to, you know, 3000 headcount. You know, it's not based on budget availability. And I've seen strategic be 3000 plus I see usually mid market relying somewhere around 300 to 1000 and then SMB being sub 300 is usually how people are defining it. But to me, there is no static definition of how people are defining it. It's kind of like for titles internally, like people aren't statically defining a manager as this. Like I've seen VP individual contributors. I've seen, you know, managers who are third line, you know, it, it depends on, on the company, but um, yeah. So no, no static definition. Thank you. So uh, let's jump in here. Bridgebound based on history. This is going to be the second category. And this is uh, basically a category for people who have some past interaction with your company. So uh, number one is going to be people who requested a demo but didn't schedule one. I've seen um, anywhere from a 12 to 25 percent conversion on the high end of people who requested a demo and actually got a demo. Now, let's argue that 35 percent were unqualified. There's still uh, folks at 40, 45% gap of people who requested a demo, but didn't actually get one based on process. I digress. Here's a play. <laughs> uh, number two, close lost. So there's four different buckets of close lost here. And this, I'm defining this as close lost. You got a actual answer from the person. You know, uh, so number one would be they went competitive uh, and they're up on renewal. This play I'd suggest of like, okay, they went to my competitor. I'm going to get lethal about dequal reasons in my CRM and I'm going to segment everyone uh, around 10 months from now to automate into that sequence of like, oh, they're up on renewal, wanna see if they're happy uh, kind of thing. But 2B is gonna be uh, closed loss. They didn't hit ICC, meaning they didn't hit the appropriate amount of size. Let's say there were only 85 people and you need it to be 100. You know, I would put the trigger in my CRM that as soon as they hit 100, they automate into that sequence because they had interest and now they're, they're big enough. At uh, 2C, they didn't hit ICC, meaning there's a qualifying criterion, like let's say tech stack, you know, outreach, you know, needs to, uh, let's say hypothetically feed into a CRM, not true, but they need to feed into a CRM. So let's say that people who didn't have a CRM, I would put in my, I would get lethal about dequal reasons, you know, of like, there's no ambiguity. It's like they didn't have this piece of tech stack. They didn't have this integration. So as soon as they do have that integration, I want to pull a short list of all the people that wanted to buy us, you know, but didn't have that integration that we now, or uh, didn't, had a piece of tech that we didn't integrate with. And now we do integrate with them. So I have a whole bunch of customers ready at my fingertips. 2D, uh, you messed up. <laughs> That's the only other option. They went with a competitor. They weren't qualified from an ICC or qualifying criteria or you messed up. So this is you messed up and they, uh, they told you a reason. So the reason would look like no budget, bad timing, et cetera. Uh, number three would be they demoed in the past, but they ghosted or went dark. So here you also messed up, <laughs> but at least in, in 2D, they, in 2D they, they told you a reason. Uh, and number three, uh, you don't know essentially what happened. Uh, number four is going to be executive churn. This is a very interesting category. So uh, shout out to user gems if they're on the line, but executive churn is people who have used your tech in the past. So, you know, let's say in the first instance, I, I had used outreach and I was at Oracle, you know, and so I fell in love with outreach as a platform. And then I went on to IBM and, uh, you know, now outreach, th that person knows outreach right? They know the value prop. They found a lot of value. And so it's super easy to sell into them because they know what the entire thing looks like. 
uh, and user gems can help you automate all of this. It comes down to automation. I think people want to do this play a lot, but they don't. Uh, it, it's you, impossible to automate it, right? And I think the stat is within the first 90 days that uh, people have made like 85% of their purchasing decisions when that comes to people, tech, et cetera. So this is very time sensitive. Uh, 4B is going to be people who, uh, you know, let's say I use outreach and I was at LinkedIn Talent Solutions, and then I change roles internally to LinkedIn Marketing Solutions, and they have not bought outreach yet. So I would want to know that of like, oh, they know outreach and they have, um, they they uh, know the the value prop here. Uh, 4C is going to be people who never used your product, but they took a role at a very high, uh, you know, buyer persona for you of like, I would want to know when a new VP of sales is in, so I can run the play of like, hey, you know, welcome to Twilio. Uh, you know, here's a couple articles that you you might like, and then you like go in for the kill of like, you know, based on this criterion, I thought, you know, go in to try to get a meeting, but this is people who slip into the buyer persona role um, as a new hire um, at a company that you're trying to get into. Five is they opened your prospecting emails. <clears throat> Six is they aggressively opened your prospecting emails. The difference being in the play, if someone opens my prospecting emails, I typically run a play where I call them twice right then, that day, and twice the next day, and then resume in the existing sequence. Uh, Cause it's like right person, right time. Like they just opened my email. You know, I wanna, wanna be in front of them. Six is they aggressively opened my emails. And what I mean by aggressive is like 15 or more. If you're using personalization, this is gonna happen a lot where they're either number one, passing it to your competitor or number two, the more likely scenario, at least in my experience is they're passing around to their internal team and they're like, you should prospect like, you know, like Johnny. Johnny just did this amazing thing and personalized. So the play there can be different in that case scenario. I, you're going to think I'm crazy, but I usually have my reps follow up and apologize for the personalization and make sure they didn't overstep their bounds, add a piece of value of like an article or a referral, and then you say, I'm, just, I'm going to leave you alone now. And the person usually within 15 minutes is like, no, because they'll go to their team and they'll be like, Johnny's awesome. Everyone should prospect like this person. I'm going to take a meeting with Johnny. And then they don't actually take the meeting with Johnny. So you want to politely, you know, fall on your sword and, and remind them. And um, my uh, another tip here is I wouldn't be like, hey, I sent you that coffee mug, you know, like, are we doing the meeting or what? They owe you nothing, you know, so I would walk in and it seems like a high risk, high uh, reward play. And it is, but I'd say some of the biggest meetings that I've gotten in my career are based on that play. Uh, so I do like certain plays. Number six, I really like. Uh, seven, uh, this is a play that I don't love, but vendors who just sold you their product. This happens in tech all the time. Tit for tat, I hate it. Let's move on. <laughs> <laughs> Quickly, <laughs> I agree. That needs to stop, particularly in SaaS. Um, demo. Questions. Another one from Alex Greer. Uh, when you call, uh, do you double tap with a call? And then if no answer, immediately call again. I would wait like a couple hours. I I don't like the uh, the double tap call because it essentially that to me is emergency based. So I am very roof. I'm savage about having done research, but I play by the rules in terms of timing. Like I'm not going to email someone on Sunday night. Mm -hmm. I'm not going to email someone on Saturday. I'm not going to call them at seven a.m. Are they in the office? Maybe. But like, I want to respect my prospects eight to five. You know, I want to play within the rules of the, of the game from that perspective, uh, you know, pattern interrupt for the right reason. So to me, a double tap, yes, it will get you more, more answers. But essentially, I would take that as you had an emergency that you had to call me back. And I think your likelihood of converting that person into like, they feel duped almost of like, oh, I picked this up thinking it was something wrong with someone from my family. So I would not suggest it from a preference perspective. I think, again, you'll get a lot of answers, but I think people will be, you know, we're anti-spam, right? So I'd just be be cognizant of that. Yeah. Um, uh, we, so I had sneak sneak one, one more in. Um, do you leave a message each time you call? No. Oh, heck no. <laughs> I'm doing 10 calls over the course of 21 business days. And I would view it as, you know, I've gotten three uh, random calls from numbers that I don't know since we've been on this webinar, right? Do I know who they are? No, I don't. Um, so essentially, 
uh, sorry, I had to plug in my computer. No, essentially, I, I would not leave a voicemail every time. You know, once they pick up the call, it's game on. But I would say I leave two voicemails over the course of those 10 cold calls. Um, because every time you're going on and you can see more on the, the front uh, or the front slide, but it shows you where I leave a voicemail, but I usually do one near the beginning and one near the end, because essentially like you're going on record that you called like, <laughs> this is going to sound bad. I want to blow the dude up, you know, and then when he picks up, be like, oh, this is the first time that I called. <laughs> I don't want to go on record and leave him 17,000 messages being like, hey, you know, uh, how to lose a guy in 10 days style, like, hey, this back, checking in, how are you doing? What are you doing? Da -da -da. So I would only leave two voicemails over the course of the entire playbook. Okay, cool. We got some more questions, but let's, uh, let's get through it. We're running up on time. Let's, can we go 10 minutes after? Am I allowed that? Yeah, let's, just okay. for you, Beck, of okay. course. 10 minutes, 10 minutes after, and uh, I'll try to keep it to seven and then we can do a couple more questions to close. So those first two bridge bound categories, were the bridge bound categories that essentially raise the likelihood that they'll take a meeting, but not necessarily that they'll buy. This category, bridge bound three, based on symptoms, pains, and problems, will, I hope, break the internet. So people usually say like, hey, I hear every sales trainer say, once you get the person into discovery who has the problem that we solve for, I can take it from there. And I'm like, well, no, no crap, Sherlock, but how do you get them? How do you get all of the people that have the problem that you solve for, right? You, you can't have a conference. It's like, if you have this problem, show up, you know, and then prospect in there. So people hide their problems. Go to social media. They don't sit there and post about, you know, unless it's vulnerability capital, they don't sit there and post about like, hey, we didn't hit our numbers and we don't know what to do about it. You know, they, they choke that back. And especially with salespeople, they are trained to not let you into their problems. Like it's your, your job to earn the right to that. So this is a way to sequence people who are showing the signs overtly that they have pain, symptoms, and problems that you, you have. So um, I, I am deferring, there is a trainer I'm collaborating with who is absolutely brilliant, who got my mind thinking about this, about problems. So I can't, I actually would attribute this to him. Um, but within this category, the first type of sequence you can run is people who left negative reviews of your competitor on something like G2. So they, number one, have the problem uh, of what your tech solves for or your product solves for. And number two, they didn't solve it with your competitor. So we got a double problem. Uh, number two, uh, churned customers of your competitors is a big book. You know, if again, they were looking to solve uh, the problem was with this piece of tech or your product, and they essentially, from a long-term perspective, didn't find the value in the buy because they churned. Uh, number three is act of God. So this is uh, a sequence that I would run when there's an inorganic spike in demand for your product, and I would go relevance only here. So for instance, if I, you know, was a Zoom employee, you know, come around March 2020, all of a sudden I'm sending out a relevant only, you know, campaign because there's an inor inorganic level of problem that people need to solve for using me. And these are the, ho these are the sequences that I hope, um, you know, change things for people. But number four through nine, there's three things I want you to pay attention to. Four and five are based on business impact. Six and seven are based on a lagging indicator. And eight and nine are based on a variable. So four and five, four is the presence of a negative output. So for instance, I sell sales training, right? Hypothetically, I sell sales training. So I would want to put in this sequence, anyone, any public company that has missed their Q4 goals, revenue goals. I don't know if they need sales training, but it's reasonable to think that they do based on they hit, they didn't hit their business impact goals. So someone's in trouble, you know, or someone needs a, some, some level of enablement. Um, so four is you can see overt from a negative output, like I would think through if someone didn't have my, pro what is the problem that my product solves for? And if they don't get that problem alleviated, what does it typically result in? And then how can I sequence those people into this sequence? 
Uh, number five is absence of a positive output. So if people are hitting their goals, the first thing they usually do is go to LinkedIn and smear it in everyone's face. <laughs> so this would be, you know, like, okay, people, companies who have gone quiet, they're not posting, you know, a lot about how great their team is doing, et cetera, et cetera. They're not doing PR releases, you know, so like in a weight loss example, you know, if people have usually the figure that they want, the first thing they do is go to Facebook and post, you know, the pictures of themselves in a bathing suit. <laughs> Right. So this would be people who are not posting pictures of themselves in a bathing suit. If, a, you know, I was selling weight loss, uh, you know, training or et cetera. Uh, six and seven are based on lagging indicators. So, for instance, um, I work a lot with teams on their inbound demo request process. Again, I've seen 12 to 25 percent conversion of people who requested a demo that got into a demo bizarre, right? So if I wanted to test for a lagging indicator, I could essentially go to, let's say, Twilio's website, and I could request a demo. And if it took any more than, you know, five minutes to get a piece of outreach, or heaven forbid, you know, days, or and then it took a, a week to get into a, an appointment, and all of a sudden, I'm being qualified by an SDR who doesn't know my business, and then it's another week before I got into an actual blown demo. I don't know if they're churning users in that process, but it's reasonable to guess. So I would think through, you know, how can I test for essentially the one expertise area that I have? So a great instance for outreach would be like if someone sends me a uh, messaging and it's not that high quality, you know, I'm like, oh, well, this person probably, you know, needs outreach to increase increase uh, the, the quality of their messaging. So six is presence of a, a negative, what I call midput. So it's a lagging indicator, you know, and seven, seven is absence of a positive midput. Like I haven't seen great messaging coming from this team. Uh, eight and nine is going to be inputs. So in the weight loss example, you know, number eight is going to be presence of a negative input. So I go over to someone's house. I haven't even seen them. You know, but all I see in their house is Oreos and Twinkies and like Dr. Pepper, you know, so I don't know if this person has their ideal figure, but I can guess based on what I see them eating. So from a business acumen perspective, I would want to know teams that um, teams that are, are in hyper growth, you know, they have 30 sales employees, they only have two managers, they have no tech and they have no enablement. I don't know if they're in trouble and they grew overnight. I don't know if they're in trouble, but I'm assuming, you know, based on what I'm seeing that these variables would lead to hypothetically, like I essentially, I need to know them, but I don't need to know them to put them in the sequence of like, based on these couple of variables, I would guess that they're going to run into the problem that my product solves for. And nine is the absence of a positive input. So in the weight loss example, you go in through their, their uh, fridge and you don't see any vegetables. You don't see anything. Right. So you're like, OK, they're probably going out to eat a lot, you know, et cetera. But it's like conclusions that I can draw based on the signs that I'm seeing from an output perspective, uh, impact lagging indicator and variable perspective, you know, overt signs of like this person. I don't know if they're sick, but they look really pale, you know, and they've got, you know, something <laughs> hanging down here and they're sneezing a lot. So I'm guessing that there's a problem internally. So it's more likely you know, that this person would ultimately need to buy, no one's going to buy a product unless they have a problem, right? If I'm a, a smart person, and even if Manny introduces me to someone and I out of respect jump on the call, if I don't have the problem, I'm not going to purchase it. So this is a great way to be intentional about sequencing the people, you know, that have the problem and not waiting for discovery. And then the initial call is like, well, tell me what keeps you up at night, Scott. And then he's like, you, I don't want to answer that question. I don't want to answer that question. Like you pitch me your product, you know, kid. And then the kids pitching based on features, et cetera. This is a very intentional way to understand. Like, I think this pro a person's probably running into these problems. Scott, you look like you have a question. And we got one more category. One no, no, more. We're, we're all good. Let's keep, okay. keep it rolling. Yeah. Last category is bridge bound based on an educated guess that they're in market. There's five sequences for this one. Number one is a channel play. So if I essentially, if I'm outreach, for instance, and I notice that they just bought data, 
you know, then all of a sudden, a like, I don't know if they necessarily need sales engagement, but where are they going to put all those contacts? Why did they buy all those email addresses and phone numbers if they're not going to reach out to them? And so this is a channel play, not an intentional setup of a channel play, like you have an agreement, but like, for instance, you know, chorus and outreach play really well together for conversation intelligence. Whenever, you know, outreach, someone would buy outreach, it's like they probably in market for conversation intelligence too. And so you can sequence them into that play and be very intentional about it. Uh, number two is they're evaluating competitor. Full disclosure, this is the only non-automatable one in the deck. It's fire if you can figure it out. So network, you know, keep your, uh, I know a couple of people that I can think of that just have their thumb on the industry and they find out through people you know, uh, but uh, really, really well. But this is a high, high, uh, you know, very lucrative campaign to run because you know that they're a value, like not only are, are uh, you know, you're if you're selling in this situation, not only would you win, but you would win out of the mouth of the lion, right, of who you're competing with. So that's a really effective play. And then the last three here are firmographic triggers that signal to you that they're likely in market. So a couple popular ones here, um, companies that IPO, you, you can automate in there of like all the people, you know, let's say Slack IPO'd and uh, all of a sudden I want to, uh, you know, sell into them. Like, I think that that's a really good sign. People usually buy in tech. So uh, I want to uh, sequence all the companies that IPO'd uh, within the, you know, first couple of weeks of IPO and all of my contacts within the CRM at Slack into the sequence. Four is a firmographic trigger based on company funding, very popular one. I'd say, you know, again, with the plays that I don't love, I would be very careful here. I wouldn't say like, hey, I noticed you have cash. Like, can we talk? Because I want some of it <laughs> kind of thing. Like, be very careful with the language. I would go personalization only and just be appropriate enough to not necessarily, you know, hit on the company funding all the time. Uh, and then number five is they are in hyper growth. So you can define hyper growth of, I want companies who have hired, you know, 50 sales employees or more over the last two months to be, you know, referenced into the sequence, because if they're hiring people, they're probably, you know, pulling on tech. So that, that is everything for Bridgebound. And the last one is just cold bound. This is far right. You have no one to many reason, you know, so you essentially go personalization only. So we want to do, hey, Scott, you're on mute. I was just unmuting myself. This was amazing, as always. And only seven, seven minutes is not bad. Seven <laughs> minutes is not bad. Um, everyone, thank you for the incredible engagement. Um, there is a ton of content on flipthescript.co. Go check it out. Uh, you can see replays of, of this session. Uh, I know a lot of people are chiming in, really like the personalization stuff. There's an entire personalization section on there. Um, so go follow on LinkedIn, connect with Beck, go to flipthescript.co. There's a ton, a ton of stuff. Um, Beck, what do you want to leave, uh, leave everyone with? That was incredible, as always. I want to leave everyone with, um, there's much more science to it than you think. You know, there's much more science and predictability than uh, I think people uh, give sales credit for. And I think if you are intentional about sequencing people and uh, putting all of these plays together, then you can, we are in a spot, an interesting spot in the industry where, uh, you know, these three reps just produce and we don't necessarily know why. And, you know, I guess we should train them on product knowledge more and everyone's, you know, hit this crux of, you know, 85% of AEs aren't hitting 85% of their quota or more, right? So most of them are not. And 76% of SDRs aren't hitting quota. So I think that we've reached a bridge in the industry. So I hope this is just the beginning of like, hey, here are all the plays. You tell me more about the tactical of what you want included here. But I think if we're very intentional about the plays and we're very intentional about, um, you know, the, the personalization and the effort for it and the structure of it, you know, then it can turn it into, and I, I think salespeople don't like the word science, but I will remind you, um, you know, art is defined as beauty of the expression just for uh, the sole use of expression, right? So I hope there's no art in sales. <laughs> You know, there's, there is some je ne sais quoi to it of like, there's 3% of that's just that person, but I think there's a lot of predictability to it. And so if you can put down that argument of, well, I don't want to science out this thing. Um, and I'm not saying science out with scripts. 
I'm saying science out from structure and how do you marry that with creativity? So you allow your reps, you know, to be more creative and be more intentional about what they're doing. I think you'd be surprised on the, uh, you know, the, uh, what it enables them to do. So I hope again, this is just the beginning and I'm excited to, to be a part of it, um, but to see what people's results are and, you know, what plays they're running and how much success that they're having on the back end. Awesome. Awesome. Well, thank you, Beck. Um, we'll have more stuff with Beck and Sales Hacker in the future. We've got a lot of cool stuff lined up. So keep your eye out. Thank you, everyone, for staying uh, past the, the end. Always great engagement. Thank you so much. And uh, we'll see you next time. See you later.